very much for all attending this session, the broker of the future. Um, lots of mentions so far of Amazon, Uber, incredible technologies that are pushing our world to a place that is absolutely fantastic for consumers, users. Insurance is probably not the same. Um, insurers, historically, um, probably not the sexiest of, uh, of industry focuses. Insurance brokers, definitely not the sexiest of uh, industry focuses in financial services. And insure techs are really doing a fantastic job at trying to pick this market up by its feet uh, and get it into the 21st century, which is absolutely fantastic. The purpose of this session is as it looks, but it should be quite, a, a, quite an action-packed, quick session. I'm just here to introduce it. My name is Will Wright. I run the technology and cyber team at Paragon Insurance Brokers. We've got Silence coming on to do a live hack to show just how easy it really is for somebody to get hold of a malicious uh, piece of data and mess up the world. Uh, and then we have a fireside chat um, with some industry leaders and uh, individuals who have an awful lot to say on the topics of crypto, blockchain, ICOs, fintech, insurtech, Lloyds of London, and insurance. I think actually the video that Seb shows at, at the beginning of the day with all of the incredible advancements in technology pretty much sums up the landscape that, that we're working in today. You know, gone are the days of the Amstrad, here is AWS. Gone are taxi cabs, here's Uber. What's insurance going to do about that? And certainly what's the insurance broking community going to do about that? Technology's changing, apps are becoming interoperable, social communities are talking to each other real time, selling to each other real time, and operational software is absolutely off the charts. So what does that mean for risk? From an insurance perspective, this is a minefield that we're trying to stay ahead of. Mention of Hiscox, early pioneers in the cyberspace, absolutely fantastic. I think it's time that the brokers had to take a step forward here and try and lead the way a little bit with product innovation. Try and bring together some of these fabulous insure techs into the community so that we're communicating to clients as one, not as individual companies pitching our wares. Making it easier for buyers to get a hold of insurance, to understand why they buy insurance, and particularly as a cyber broker, to understand how our products work and what they insure, because quite a lot of people are being misled by that. There's a lot of stuff in the press, whether it's GDPR related, crypto insurance related, soft wallet, hot wallet, cold wallet, any wallet, there's a lot of chat. So we're here to demystify that. The landscape. Cloud businesses, shared economies, interconnectivity, blockchain. This is probably a very oversimplified way that cyber insurance views the landscape for businesses to operate in. Cloud's obviously driving, um, driving the world. Um, shared economies, big buzzword. Interconnectivity is pretty terrifying from a, from, a, from a risk aggregate perspective. And blockchain is pioneering the way that professional services can operate. Business interruption, IT recovery, data breach, old friend GDPR, legal costs, crime, crisis comms, ransomware. These are just the vectors that loss occurs. And I think really we're just going to drop these in as snippets here because Paragon's going to be here all day. If anybody wants to talk about cyber insurance, we can talk about how these vectors impact your businesses, your customers' businesses, or have some relevance to the sector that you're operating in. But fundamentally, this is the landscape. Who are Paragon? Might be a new word to some of you in the room. Hopefully it won't be new for long. Established 1996, we're an executive lines broker. Focus on only five headers of cover, but one key one, the team here today is technology and cyber. We place about 100 million pounds of cyber and technology premium into the market from companies across the UK, America, the Middle East, and Latin America. We're the largest independent, which is very important to us, technology and cyber broking team, possibly in the world, but don't have that verified, so I'll probably calm down on that front. Um, but the key for us, our business model, everything that we're about, and listening to these fantastic speakers so far, is trying to simplify the product, trying to make it easy to understand, trying to make it intuitive. Something exciting that we're going to be bringing to the market in 2019 is our ecosystem, which we're in the process of building. And the team would be delighted to talk to anybody that wants to know a little bit more about how, how that's going to work. But needless to say, we want to bring social media to our clients through, for insurance purposes. We want to bring relevant content to our clients. We want to make it easy for them to purchase insurance. And we want to make it easy for them to understand it. And we want to make it relevant and current. We've developed our own fintech product to try and address those emerging needs. 
which again, we can talk about offline. I probably won't bore you with that here. Um, and a brand that hopefully you'll all become familiar with in the future is Paragon Prime, which is our proprietary technology cyber media insurance product. Uh, it's, it's as future-proofed as it can be for now, which as I'm sure we're gonna feel throughout the rest of the day, doesn't last very long. Um, we're here to help. We've got a stand downstairs. We'd love to uh, hear any questions or issues you wanna talk through. Um, that's me done. I'm now gonna pass it over to the guys at Silence who are here to do a live hack and show really just how unbelievably simple it is to be compromised. Hi, so thanks for having us. Uh, Silence, seventh biggest data science company, so all about AI. Uh, and in that, we're looking to, to find and stop the harder, harder to catch breaches. And really the point of our session today is to talk to you about how easy it is to make a reasonably hard to stop cyber attack. So my colleague Jimmy is up in the wings, has the enviable task of a live demo here. Uh, and I'm Luke, I spent uh, somewhere around 20 years breaking into everything from the military to banks to retail. Uh, and I'm hoping to talk through what he's doing and uh, kind of add some flavor. So here we go. So we're going to be looking at a couple of, uh, couple of computers here, pretty much the same as you see in your office. One of them is basically going to be an attacker, and he's going to use malware as a service. So the ransomware, if you're familiar with it, basically you drop a file on someone's machine, it encrypts the things they put value to, and they have to pay you to, to get it back. So not a good place to be in. This could equally be what we call a remote access trojan. At that point, someone's fully controlled your PC. They can upload, download, whatever. So data loss today, but lots of different threats. Um, we've got an attacker machine who's actually going to build you some ransomware. He's got a bunch of files on here, pictures, a CV, um, things he cares about. In a business, this may be HR databases. It could be anything. It could be software, crypto wallets. It could be a Bitcoin sitting there. Um, we've got a couple of victims. We're going to show you a couple of flavors of how it can play out. Uh, lots of this actually stems from big governments who've kind of pioneered these attacks. Uh, they, they often use criminals as gateways to perform them. The criminals have then thought, hang on. I can make some money here, so they provide a fully as a service, it's free to, to engage with, way to build and launch your own cyber attacks. And then when they pay the ransom, it comes back to you. They take a good percentage, it's around 20%, you get 80% back in. Uh, really low barrier to entry, quite hard to stop. So this is the attacker machine. This is the person who's gonna be actually building it. They've got a couple of free tools which talk to the dark web. This one's called Atom, and it is going to actually build you some ransomware. We're gonna start with something fairly simple here but you're putting in a Bitcoin address, which is effectively a wallet the payment will go to, and this is the attacker's actual wallet. So this is me launching this attack today, going to this company who will run it as a service for me. This is who they send the money to. Uh, I put in a price I'm gonna pay, so I think we're, we're going for 0.2 of a Bitcoin, which at the moment is about 1,000 pounds. So uh, you can put whatever you want in there. There's a, as a real um, body of work starting to come through around tolerances. People will typically pay a few hundred, companies a bit more, Bigger companies maybe not pay and they'll take the hit. Uh, we then choose what sort of files we want to encrypt. So you can do everything, which is what he's done here. You could do just the CV, you could do Word documents, you could do PDF, photos, dot .dat for a Bitcoin wallet. Uh, depends kind of how subtle you want to be. You can then give it a Bitcoin address to pay. He's then generating an actual file. Uh, in this case, he's building a file which would run on the victim's machine. So there's some element of trickery to get them to do it, which we'll cover a few scenarios of. Uh, he's built it, so he's named it after a Microsoft patch, which will become significant in a bit, but it's something that people, um, maybe not end users, but certainly home machines you'd expect to see. And he's then gonna add a bit more uh, detail to it. So if you can see in the bottom right here, it's actually just got quite a generic icon to it. Uh, he's got a second dark web program here, again, both free, both make money off your actions, so they kind of, um, there's a model behind it, there's a reason it's free. And this lets you do a bunch of stuff around hiding forensics, make it hard to catch, but also you can add your own icons. You can, uh, you can pick, say, Word or Adobe or um, whatever you like, Internet Explorer, and your actual piece of ransomware will look like it's that program. So a nice way to trick people into running it. In this case, he's going for Microsoft Word, so it looked like an Office document. So he's just gonna click that, and it's just, like, just gonna take the picture from the shortcut and add it to this file. So it's, uh, it's pretty straightforward. We've seen everything from super complicated attacks based on kind of job adverts on LinkedIn through to really basic kind of Word documents and Adobe documents and things which uh, you might send out on bulk. You kind of, they work to a ratio of maybe one in 10,000 people pays this. A lot of the ransomware will spread itself once it affects machine now. So if 
100 people in the company get it and one click it, that's really all you need. It will then start to move across the network and, and encrypt everything else. So he's now, uh, he's now rebuilding it, so it's, uh, it's more sneaky. He's now got himself a, a Word document, as it appears. So he's going to now send this off to the first of the two victims we have. So in this case, you might do it via a, um, a USB. So we've actually seen cases where internal attackers go into a company and purposely infect the company. It looks like it's an external attack and bad luck, but they're taking the, the money at the other end. Because of the nature of Bitcoin wallets, it's very hard to actually ever prove definitively who did it and where it's gone. But he's now uploaded it to a file share. The user is putting it off a file share, thinking it's a document. In this case, we called it my payload, but it could be anything. Uh, he's going to double click this, and you'll see it's now going through, looking for all those files we selected, in this case everything, and encrypting it. It's not going to do the bits that actually make the computer work, so you're not going to destroy the computer. What you're targeting is user data. So you've now seen all the files, all the, all the photos, all his CV have been encrypted. Uh, they're unopenable. Yeah, if you didn't have good backups, you, you're kind of sunk at this point. If you do have good backups, well, some of the ransomware waits a few hours before it encrypts and does your backups too. So um, it, it's... They've thought of everything. So at this point, the user is kind of in limbo. Um, they have a bunch of files they can't use. They will eventually get a splash screen, although it takes a little while. Um, and they need to then pay someone to get them back. Or phone the help desk, potentially more realistically. So that we've now got a splash screen. So they've got 72 minutes to pay. Uh, the value is the same. The Bitcoin wallet is now different because uh, they're paying a, an intermediary. They're paying the person who's providing the service. They're going to take their commission and pass it back to you. So, so we won't actually do the payment here. But if you want to do things like change the language, uh, they've made it fully featured. So you, you want to help people pay, you can just go in and, and change it to whatever language the user uses. Uh, this second victim, we're getting a bit more colorful. So somewhere around 80% of these attacks in, in the real life, and especially at the higher end, happen via phishing emails. So we've all seen them. Uh, in this case, we've sent a phishing email from your bank. Um, I've seen them get progressively better over the last five years from really broken, really bad English to um, actually stealing documents from the company and sending them back in, uh, but then at that point kind of weaponized. So he's been asked to change his password, told his bank account's compromised. When he goes to change his password, he has been told he is missing a security patch. So again, this isn't the most sophisticated attack, but it's really easy to do, and you only need one person to really fall for it and the, the entire company's data, unless they're very up to date, is gone. So he is downloading his Microsoft patch. He's going to get a, a, a warning that it's a potentially malicious file, as you do whenever you download a, a patch. But he's actually put a message on the pop-up telling them that will happen. So he's kind of trying to pre-bake it. He then runs his update, and it's the same story as before. At that point, all the files have gone. The difference here is he didn't have to do anything particularly clever just to get it to the victim. He can send it out as a mass email to everyone he's got an address for. He can buy a commercial mailing list. He can stick it on a website as a download, really whatever, whatever works. Um, if he runs that, he's going to get back to his point where the files are gone. We actually have a, uh, an interesting culture here because there was a ransomware called Crypto Wall a few years ago. They made about 500 million off payments on that. And the reason they made the money, it was kind of small and medium businesses. Larger businesses tend to have a fair internal cost, but don't pay the ransom. They kind of clean it up, they store from backups. So you've seen a couple of really big ransomware attacks recently made very little money. Um, this sort of attack against a smallish company or a company without a huge IT stack uh, is going to be pretty devastating and they're pretty in the wind and what they do with it afterwards. So we're now running it on the second victim. You're going to see a re-encryption of the same files, and you're going to see that splash screen. What we're going to do next is actually show you how easy it is to pay. Again, run as a service, made as easy as possible for, to actually get the money off you, uh, and, and hence pass it back to the, uh, the originator. So if you want to pay this, first of all, you can change the language, as I mentioned. So you can go in and set it for whatever the user actually wants to deal with. And then if you actually want to pay, they set you up with a nice, easy link through to a, a Bitcoin purchasing site. I think in this case, we're using BitBase. The idea is, if it's your grandmother at home or something, um, the technical skill isn't really going to stop them from paying. So in this case, we're setting the country we live in. We're setting how we want to pay, and we can do bank transfer, credit card, whatever we like, really. Uh, it, it's going to be based off the current Bitcoin price. Once they're, they're done, um, and this is, 
you know, most of the exchanges they use here are legitimate companies, but because of the nature of Bitcoin, it's very hard to say if the person using it is good or bad, so it kind of just goes through. Again, all these programs speak back to the dark web, so the actual setup and the, um, it's kept current, it's kept off um, law enforcement's radar to a large point. Um, there's an SLA on some of these where if you don't get it working, your ransomware doesn't take their files. You have a six hour support. And again, there's no cost up front here, it's just taken as a commission. So, six hour support line, someone will speak to you um, anonymously and help you get to the point where the person's lost their data. Uh, in this case, it would simply be a case of filling a form in. Um, you put your username in, you create a password, you put your credit card number in, and they go and make a payment, they buy you some Bitcoin, and they send it off to the, uh, the company. Okay, so that's the demo. Um, I can't restate how easy this is. It's, there's a gr group of people who do understand it at the back end, but they're running it as a service. Um, there's a group of very clever people who make a lot of money who kind of trickle the older stuff down. There's groups above them who are government sponsored and, and kind of have the latest whizzy stuff. Uh, so there's a strong ecosystem and it's, um, it's always moving. <laughs>